All right, I'm going to be uh, analyzing platonic solids uh, in a slightly different way. Here's a traditional representation of the platonic solids. These have been sized to fit in a, a four-inch sphere, which I'll show you in a second. And I'm going to basically be projecting these platonic solids onto the surface of a sphere to continue my analysis, which you'll see in the next section. So you can see here that now this tetrahedron is inside this sphere and like you can see it's better with white background basically if you project the edges to the, the sphere you can see it cuts out a huge spherical triangle and now we know the surface area of the sphere is 4 pi for unit sphere so quite simply we have surface area of pi for each of these four spherical polygons of the spherical tetrahedron. Now here we have the square. Of course it divides its spherical surface into six spherical squares. In this case, four pi divided by six is two pi over 3. So now if we continue on to the spherical octahedron, again inside the same sphere, 8 sides, dividing t total surface area of 4 pi, we end up with a surface area of simply pi over 2. Again, you know, quite simple. Here we have the spherical dodecahedron with its 12 sides. Each of these happen to be simply pi over 3. And lastly, we have the spherical icosahedron with just 20 sides. And it turns out to having a surface area of pi over 5. Alright, nothing of extreme importance here, but I just want to put that as a reference point for future discussion. Okay, now let me show you what these things look like with the polyhedra removed. And that is our spherical tetrahedron. This is a spherical cube. This is a spherical octahedron. Here is the spherical dodecahedron. And one thing I've done now that is going to be useful, and here's the spherical icosahedron, is that now these spherical polyhedra are normalized to the same sphere, and we can start comparing the geometric properties of each of these a lot easier than we could do with this standard um, platonic solids. And I'll demonstrate that in a minute. So I've drawn a spherical tetrahedron on the surface of the sphere. You can see it's four sides. I've also got basically part of a spherical cube. And now we can overlap their edges and axes and kind of see how the edge of a spherical tetrahedron is the diagonal of the spherical square cube. Now let me continue adding this on. So now you actually can see how the axes of the spherical tetrahedron line up with some of the axes of the spherical cube. I can continue doing this for pairs of uh, the platonic solids, which I'll show you. So here we have a spherical dodecahedron drawn on a sphere, which I can overlap now with that of a cube. And now you can again see how we have an alignment. In fact, you can see, I'll show you in a minute, um, how this thing completely lines up a dodecahedron. As you can see, each square face 
of the spherical cube is perfect alignment with the dodecahedron. And the other observation, if you can see the this diagonal of this pentagon is actually tau, the golden ratio, if basically its edge is one. Which essentially means this square face of the spherical cube is tau on each side. In fact, it might look a little clearer in this representation here where you see five sides of the spherical pentagon. And actually this diagonal here is tau, which is basically the same as the square that's also hidden below it. Now here you can see we've got the spherical cube in a lighter line underneath here. And overlaid on top of it is the spherical tetrahedron, which is a spherical tri triangle face. And basically you can see that the edge of the tetrahedron is the diagonal of the square, which we've already learned that the side of the square is tau, which makes the side of the tetrahedron root 2 times tau. Very nice relationship. Now here we have at the lower layer in this lighter gray line is the spherical tetrahedron with its triangular face. And on the other line it's the spherical octahedron. Here I'd like to demonstrate again how the axes line up with the edges of the tetrahedron versus the vertices of the octahedron. The other interesting thing is that you can see that it, the shape relationship is actually quite interesting. Where if you divide up the face of the octahedron into three, you basically can create the face of a spherical tetrahedron, which basically is this triangle here, this triangle here, this triangle here, and these ones in the center, which makes the spherical tetrahedron here. I'll be showing this with geometric models a little bit later, but basically that's the gist of it. Um, to be more clear with the a geometric model I'll introduce later on. So in order to make the analysis a little easier um, than just using the surface of a sphere, I've developed another model a representation of a spherical tetrahedron that right now is embedded inside this sphere. It has the same properties of the original tetrahedron we showed you. And if we take it out, now basically this is another way of representing a spherical tetrahedron and to some extent the tetrahedron itself. But now it allows me to actually to basically take a root component out of this tetrahedron. So essentially this is one of four polydesics, in this case a tetradesic, that makes up the spherical tetrahedron. There's a few of these. I'll show you one for each of the various um, photonics. This is the hexadesic. Maps to the spherical cube. And again, this has six root components. This is basically one hexadesic, six of which will make up the uh, spherical hexagon, sorry, spherical polyhedra. This is the octadesic. Essentially, this has eight root components that represents the spherical octahedron. This 
this is the Dodeca desic, which can be has 12 root components that can be removed and analyzed. And finally, we have our mycosa desic that fits right inside the mycosa spherical icosahedron. And not surprisingly enough, this has 20 root components that can be used for further analysis. All right, I'm going to use these spherical polygons, and I'm going to use their generic names. This is the tetrahedron, and this is the cube, or hexahedron. And I'm going to show, quite simply, how these are related that aren't quite obvious at first view. I'm going to do that by taking the surface of the tetrahedron and divide it into three equal parts. So I'll move out this face. And I'm going to put in, basically, something that's one-third the size. So this is actually pi over three, if you recall from earlier. Let's take this one out. Let's do the third one. And now finally the fourth one. So now essentially I've replaced all of the tetrahedrons with basically a subcomponent. Now we actually can sort of see now that we have formed a square face here. Essentially, anywhere I see a square face, I can transform it and remove it totally. And very quickly, this is going to completely transform into a cube. So as you see, Two of them create the face of the cube. While three of them arranged differently make the face of a tetrahedron. I'll go through a couple pairings of these platonic solids and show you very similar things. Well, now we're going to start with the dodecahedron and transform this simply by taking one of its root components and essentially dividing it along one of its diagonals and now you've got a basically a top half and a bottom half of the original pentagon. You might have thought earlier if we assume the edge of the pentagon is 1 this diagonal is going to be tau. And I'll refer to that later. So essentially we can basically replace every one of these root components with a split version of it. And I'll show you that in a second. So now we have the dodecahedron, which each one of its faces actually replaced with a part with a top and bottom half. Now you can see actually how a group come out and actually make enough room for the subcomponent of the cube to fit right in there. And I can continue replacing these pieces. We're just going to quickly transform the dodecahedron into a cube. There's a very tight relationship between the cube and the dodecahedron. And I'll go on to show you actually some relationships with the uh, icosa and the octahedron as well as the uh, tetrahedron. Okay, well now we're going to start with the uh, icosahedron with its 20 subcomponents. This time I'm going to take it <coughs> and divide this into a, a split face. Basically you've got a left half and a right half. That's going to allow us to play around. Now let's do that for the whole thing. So 
essentially now you've got a what looks you know how to recognize it, say like a quasiter right now, but basically it's consisting of forty of these left and right sides. And when arranged correctly, basically you can pull out a complete essentially one eighth of the sphere, which is equivalent to a side of an octahedron, which consists of basically five of these half pieces. When you do the area calculations, each one of these is actually, well, each one of these is to pi over five, the icosahedron. Here the half cells are basically pi over ten. So we've got five of them, that's five pi over ten, which is equal to one half, which is the same area of a phase of an octahedron. And basically, as you can see, this fits in here. Let me take this out first. These five bits of an octahedron fit perfectly inside the octahedron. And the face from the octahedron fits in perfectly here into the icosahedron. So not very visible using the traditional platonic solids to do that, but once we go in a spherical mode, basically it's much easier to see. And now we're going to explore the commonality between the tetrahedron and the octahedron. And in a similar fashion, I'm going to replace one of the faces of the octahedron with three smaller subcomponents. Which is just one third of the face of an octahedron, or pi over six as well. Now, if I continue to do that for the whole octahedron, we end up with a different view of an octahedron. But now it's going to allow us to transform this into an octahedron. by taking out six of those components, which basically is a perfect fit for the face of the tetrahedron. And in addition, these eight subcomponents of the octahedron fit nicely into the octahedron. Well, now we're going to take the tetrahedron, which has commonality with both the cube and the octahedron, and in essence, that leads to commonality across all five platonic solids. And I'm just going to slowly substitute in the other platonic solids, kind of face by face. So I'll swap out this tetrahedron face, put in a, a version from an octahedron. Let's do the same thing on an adjacent face. On the remaining two sides, I'm going to swap in these three components as I earlier from the hexahedron. And let's swap out the final one and place in the final piece. So now basically it's kind of a hybrid object that's kind of 50-50 between a cube and an octahedron. But right here I notice I can actually swap out this pair to put inside from a cube. Or, in fact, I can, in addition to that, put in pieces from the dodecahedron to fit right into the square. Much like we can actually take out a complete piece of a octahedral face, and swap in components that basically came from the icosahedron, and I could even swap out this triple and put in the original octahedron. So basically here now you've got representation from the icosahedron. you got the dodecahedron as well as a square underneath it. And of course we started with the tetrahedron. Uh, the tetrahedron. So there you have it. Completely integrated bits and pieces from all the platonic solids fit onto the same surface of a sphere.